Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I was grateful that today's hearing, at least as far as the committee is concerned, is a lot more dignified and civil. And, um, but unfortunately, some of the hijinks continue even on the Senate floor. I know Senator McConnell asked consent for the Judiciary Committee to continue meeting during today's session of the Senate. Senator Schumer objected, so Senator McConnell was left with no option but to uh, adjourn the Senate and allow the committee to continue to meet. That's unfortunate. So, Judge, um, I believe we met in the year 2000. Yes. And just to take a little walk down memory lane here, uh, when I was Attorney General of Texas and had a chance to argue a case in front of the Supreme Court of the United States, you, Ted Olson, and Paul Clement, I believe, yes. helped, uh, helped me get ready. <laughs> Uh, I regret you didn't have better material to work with. <laughs> but um, it was an honor, Senator. It well, it was honor. it was an, it was a great uh, great experience and uh, educational experience. But uh, I got to appreciate your skills as a lawyer uh, from that time and have followed your career closely since. And I'm um, proud to support your nomination yeah. uh, based on my personal knowledge of your skills, your temperament, and your character, and your fidelity to the rule of law. Um, but I do want to pick one bone with you. I did this. This isn't unique to you. Um, based on that experience, that case, as you may recall, involved a, a tradition in the Santa Fe Independent School District, unfortunately, which was the site of a shooting here in more recent days. But back then, um, the, the practice before football games was that the students would be able to volunteer to offer a prayer uh, before the football game. They weren't required to do so. The school didn't pick them. Uh, they could offer an inspirational saying or read a poem or anything else. But that was the practice. Well, until the ACLU uh, filed suit, and unfortunately it was held to be unconstitutional and viola violation of the Establishment Clause. I'm not going to ask for your opinions because this uh, issue will likely come back before the court. But since I mentioned it to Judge Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch, I'm going to mention it to you. The thing that is stuck in my craw for the last 18 years <laughs> is the dissent written by Chief Justice Rehnquist, mm -hmm. which uh, takes exception to the majority's decision, saying they distorted existing precedent. But he goes on to say, even more disturbing than its holding is the tone of the court's opinion. It bristles with hostility to all things religious in public life. Neither the holding nor the tone or the opinion is faithful to the meaning of the Establishment Clause. When it is recalled that George Washington's, um, that George Washington himself at the request of the very Congress which passed the Bill of Rights proclaimed a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of the Almighty God. Since I had you here, I thought I'd mention that. Yes. I'm not asking for your opinion, since likely you'll be uh, called upon to decide cases involving the Establishment Clause in the future. But since we had that history together, yes. uh, I thought I would just tell you that it still sticks in my craw. Well, I, I, all understand, these I understand, Senator. We remember uh, yeah, certainly cases I lost. I, uh, I remember, and they still stick in my craw, too, Senator. So. Well, I just, I just marvel that under the First Amendment that um, we can, uh, a variety of voices uh, can speak, and that's generally a good thing, but it can be uh, about violence, sexism, it can be about almost anything, but you can't speak about religion in, pub in a public forum. Well, uh, there have been, uh, you know, there have been cases from the Supreme Court, I think in more recent years, cases like the Good News Club case. Uh, can it, cases like the Trinity Lutheran case, cases like the Town of Greece case, where I think the Supreme Court has, has recognized uh, the importance, of course, of religious liberty uh, in the United States, and also has recognized, I think, uh, that religious speakers, religious people, religious speech uh, is entitled to a space in the public square and not to be discriminated against. I think the Trinity Lutheran case is an important one on that. The Good News Cl uh, Club case, that's a case where 
uh, as an after school program at a school uh, school gym, I think, or auditorium, and the religious group was excluded, and the Supreme Court made clear, no, you can't just exclude the religious group. So I think there have been some developments uh, since then in terms of religious equality and religious liberty that are important. Those cases are always uh, difficult factually, to, uh, but, but the princi principle you're espousing, I do think, is reflected in some more recent Supreme Court precedent. Well, I'll just conclude with this. As I understand the Constitution, it requires the government to be neutral. Yes. And as Chief Justice Rehnquist, I, I think in this case, the government evidenced hostility to religious speech in the public square. That's just one, uh, one person's opinion. And again, I'm not asking you yeah. uh, for any opinion with regard to a case that may come before the court. Mr. Chairman, I hope that won't, time won't be subtracted from my uh, 30 minutes. It will not be. Thank you. So, Judge Kavanaugh, I'm intrigued by a comment that you made earlier about the role of precedent. We've heard a lot about precedent. You alluded to this book that you and others, other judges wrote with uh, Brian Garner yes. on the law of judicial precedent. precedent. I had checked it out. It's 900 pages long, <laughs> and I haven't read every page of it either. I don't think it's meant, it's not meant to be read word for word. <laughs> it's a treatise where you go to a section that might be on point or something. But let me just ask you a more basic question, then we can work our way into that. Should, when, a, when people go to court, should they expect a different outcome if the judge was nominated by a Republican from a court where the judge was nominated by a Democrat? No. Uh, that's an important principle of the judicial independence and the judicial role. Well, I, the, the judge's umpire vision that Chief Justice Roberts articulated, and I've, I've talked about publicly many times, is critical. Uh, when you go to a baseball game, the umpire is not wearing the uniform of one team or another, and that's a critical principle. Well, it, it strikes me as an important point, given the suggestion that one of the reasons people have objected to your nomination is, I believe the quote was, you have Republican blood flowing in your veins. Uh, it strikes me as a strange and bizarre statement. I've been a judge for 12 years, Senator, and I'm 307 opinions. I'm very proud of that record and been an independent judge for 12 years. And you're not, a, as a judge, you're not a re Republican or a Democrat as a federal judge. And you talked about a little bit about the, the constitutional basis for a judge's obligation to apply existing precedent. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit more? Because I think most people are under the impression this is sort of a discretionary matter, and you can sort of cherry pick between what precedents you decide to follow and which ones uh, you don't follow. Well, there's been a debate sometimes about what are, what are the origins of precedent? Why do you follow precedent? And as I see it, uh, there are a number of reasons you would cite, stability, predictability, impartiality, uh, reliance interests, but all of those are not mere policies in my view. As I see it, the system of precedent comes from Article Three itself. When Article Three refers to the judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time uh, establish, uh, to my mind, the phrase judicial power. You think about what does that entail, and you look at the meaning, the meaning at the time of judicial power, and you look, one source of that is Federalist 78, and, and that, in Federalist 78, it's well explained that a, a judges make decisions based on precedent, and precedent, therefore, as I read judicial power, has constitutional origins and a constitutional basis uh, in the text of the Constitution. And I think you've touched on this as well. Judges, unlike legislators, don't run for election. You don't have a platform. No. Vote for me. This is what I'll do if I'm elected to, into office. One of the most important elements of, the, of limiting the important role of judges, I think, under the Constitution is that you're required to decide a case on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, 
rather than uh, issuing some sort of oracle saying, henceforth, the law will be thus. Assuming you could get eight other judges on the team of nine you talked about to agree with you. Can you talk about the importance of deciding cases on a case-by-case -case basis? We'll add another 20 seconds. Thank you. Absolutely, Senator. It's important to understand, and I, I think um, Senator Graham alluded to this as well, as judges, you don't just issue policies or issue opinions out of the blue. You decide, as the Article Three says, cases and controversies, and that means there's a process. A, a litigants come into the federal trial court, uh, and uh, for example, and uh, litigate against one another, and there's a process there, a trial or a summary judgment motion. The district judge renders a decision. Then that comes up to the uh, Court of Appeals, uh, in my case, and there's briefing and oral argument. I like to say pr there's a process. I like to say process protects you. Uh, that's one of my uh, things I always like to keep in mind. You go through a process to help make good decisions, deliberative process, and we have a process. Judges are very focused on process. And having that oral argument, having the briefing, and then talking to your colleagues, I, you change your mind. You know, Senator, you've been a, a judge, of course. Um, you change your mind sometimes based on the comments of colleagues. So that process is important. And then to your point about you're deciding that case, you write an opinion. You're not trying to resolve every issue imaginable in the opinion. You're trying to resolve this case under the principles and precedents, the text of the law in question, the text of the statute in question, and decide that case or controversy. And that's how judges build up a system of precedent over time, by deciding one case at a time and not trying to do more than they can or more than they should. And Judge, don't you think that what you've described for us and deciding cases on a case-by-case -case basis has an important foundation in fairness to the litigants, the parties that come to your court? Because how would somebody feel if they know you've already uh, announced in all cases that have to do with subject X, I've made up my mind, I don't care what the facts are. Um, isn't that unfair to the litigants? It, it, is, it can be, Senator, at least, where uh, an overbroad ruling may resolve things that people who are affected by it may have thought, well, I, didn't, I wasn't part of that case. Why am I now affected in a particular way? I, I think one of the things I can say about how I've tried to write my opinions, uh, the 300 opinions, is I'm always concerned about... Un I'm always concerned about unintended consequences. This is one of the reasons I go through so many drafts of my opinions and really work through them, is even a, just a sloppy footnote or an ambiguous word in opinion, it's true when you're drafting laws here too, but uh, if, if, if you don't, you're concerned about unintended consequences, which is why it's so important to be clear in the opinions and to be exactly precise and not to decide too much. Judge, let me ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about September the 11th, 2001. Where were you when you heard that the uh, planes hit the World Trade Center in Washington, D.C., and another plane hit the Pentagon here in Washington? Yeah, you know, I remember I was New in New York, the, I should say. Yeah, as, Washington. as in, the, in the West Wing when the the second tower, I remember that, up in the upstairs council's office uh, with a couple other people in the council's office. And then uh, we were ushered downstairs and then told to get out and run out because there was fear, as we later learned about Flight 93. I think it don't know whether it's headed to the Capitol or the White House or some other target, of course. And the heroes of Flight 93 saved saved so many Americans, uh, sacrifice uh, that, of course, we still all celebrate uh, uh, in the sense of celebrating their lives and their heroism uh, for saving all of us here in Washington, but ended up uh, out uh, in Lafayette Park with the rest of the staff and bewildered and changed America, changed, changed uh, the world. 
change the presidency, change Congress, uh, change the courts, all the issues that came before. It was a new kind of war, as President Bush described, with uh, an enemy that didn't wear uniforms and that would attack civilians. And so new kinds of laws had to be considered and Congress had to work through that. And President Bush had to uh, focus uh, so intently. And uh, as I've said before, uh, my remembrance is that on September 12th, his basic mentality was this will not happen again. And having traveling with him from 2003 to 2006 everywhere as, as staff secretary and seeing him up close, I, I still think every day I was with him during those years, every morning when he got up, it was still September 12th, 2001. This will not happen again. And to see that focus, of course, he had to do all the other things of the presidency uh, and all the other legislative and regulatory and ceremonial aspects. But uh, he was uh, fo so focused on that. I'm sure that's uh, been true of the succeeding presidents as well, because the threat, uh, the threat, the threat still exists, of, of course. Well, as we came to learn, Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda was responsible uh, for that attack, and has now morphed into other um, other organizations like ISIS and the like. But I want to ask you. Um, you had to then sit in judgment later on in a case, mm -hmm. the Hamdan case, which you've alluded to earlier, where the defendant was Osama bin Laden's personal bodyguard and driver. He was captured by U.S. forces in Afghanistan after 9-11 and detained in Guantanamo Bay. He subsequently went through a military tribunal, and then that case was appealed to your court. And just uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but notwithstanding the experience you and everybody you cared about having been through this terrible tra travesty of 9-11, mm -hmm. you ruled in favor of Osama bin Laden's bodyguard and driver, correct? Uh, that is correct. I wrote the majority opinion. How could you do that? How could you the, possibly do that? The rule of law applies to all who come before uh, the courts of the United States. Even in... Enemy combatant? Equal, equal justice under law. Everyone is entitled to... Even, no, even a non-citizen? Yes. Uh, uh, Non-citizens who are tried in U.S. courts, of course, uh, have the constitutional uh, rights. And, so, and, and really my model on that judicial model for thinking about something like that, because I thought about uh, what you're asking about. Justice Jackson, of course... Robert Jackson, who had been uh, Franklin Roosevelt's attorney general, that he's in the Korematsu case, even though that was one of President Roosevelt's policies. Justice Jackson, and now the majority opinion, now overruled. Uh, but Justice Jackson dissented and ruled against the Roosevelt policy. Justices uh, Clark and Burton, uh, two appointees of President Truman, are the two deciding votes in Youngstown Steel, that's a 6-3 decision. Those two are the deciding votes, therefore. They both w were appointees of President Truman. They get to the, and it's wartime against Korea. They get to the Supreme Court. They're the deciding votes in the Youngstown Steel case, which was an extraordinary national moment, one of the great moments. And so it's, it's your conception of the role of a judge is, the, it's about the law. That's distinct from policy, and our judiciary depends on having people in it, and we are fortunate to have a wonderful federal judiciary, people in it who understand the difference between law and policy and are willing to apply principles of equal justice under law to anyone who comes before the court, even the most unpopular possible defendant is still entitled to due process and the rule of law, and I've tried to ensure that as a judge. Well, it's hard for me to imagine a more unpopular defendant than Osama bin Laden's driver and um, personal bodyguard. So I find the suggestion that somehow you are prejudiced against the small guy in favor of the big guy, um, or that you are picking and choosing who you're going to render judgment in favor of based on something other than the rule of law, um, I think this answers that question conclusively for me. The fact that you could... 
separate yourself from the emotional involvement you had, along with so many people you worked closely with in the White House on September the 11th, and you could then, as a judge, after you put on the black robe and take the oath of office, you could then render a judgment in favor of Osama bin Laden's bodyguard and driver because you apply the law equally to everybody that comes to your court. Sometimes the, um, I think, uh, well, let me allude to uh, something Senator Sass, I think, was eloquently speaking about yesterday in terms of the separation of powers. A uh, very important aspect of our constitutional system and one that I know you've dealt with often on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and that has to do with what, what I've read um, some judges talk about, some constitutional scholars talk about a conversation between the branches. Mm -hmm. In other words, when the D.C. Circuit Court or the Supreme Court decides a case, they finally decide that case, but they don't finally decide what the policy is That's right. for the United States or the American people, correct? That's correct, Senator. And I think one of the important things that judges can do is adhere, of course, to the laws passed by Congress, but then in writing the opinion, make clear, <clears throat> and I've done this before, and a lot of my colleagues do this, is that perhaps the statute needs updating, but if it does, that is the role of Congress to update the statute. Or if there's a, sometimes there'll be a hole in a statute or something that seems unintended in a statute, and to alert uh, Congress to that. Chief Judge Katzman of the Second Circuit, who's a great judge I serve with on the Judicial Branch Committee, which is appointed by the Chief Justice, uh, and he has written a book about statutory interpretation, but he's also been a leader of a project to make sure that Congress is alerted of potential statutory issues that look like they might have been things that perhaps Congress would not have intended or at least Congress would want brought to its attention so it could fix. And, uh, it's, and so that, that project's been very successful. I think Chief Judge Katzman's project, and it's one, even without that project, how you write your opinions I think is important. Uh, we don't update the statutes. You update the statutes, but it's good for us to write our opinions in a way that points out potential uh, issues that Congress might want to be aware of. And that's part of the conversation between yes. the two co-equal branches of government. Absolutely, and I think that's an important uh, dialogue uh, to, to have uh, between Congress uh, and the judiciary, and the back and forth is very important on that front. Uh, and I think that's one thing I'm always thinking about in my opinions. You write the laws, but if the law looks like uh, there's some, some issue with it, some flaw or something that might be an unintended consequence, in the opinion you can identify it, and that can be something that uh, Congress can turn its attention to uh, sometimes. Because I'm well aware that statutory drafting is a very difficult process. That's something I think judges need to be actually more aware of, is how difficult the legislative drafting process is. Uh, even if you're doing it as one person, it would be difficult, but then you're doing it as a collective body, and then you're doing it with the House and with the uh, president involved. There are a lot of people in, and it's hard to have, with, with all the compromises inherent in that, hard to have crystal clarity on every possible topic. So as judges, I think, number one, we have to recognize the process that you go through as legislators, that means adhere to the compromises that are made, the text as written, but also when we write our opinions, if there seems to be something that's not working out, it's, it's, not, it's appropriate, I think, for judges to point that out in their opinions. And, of course, uh, even if it's a constitutional basis for your decision, uh, that could be changed by constitutional amendment, correct? Well, that's correct as well. The framers did not think the Constitution was perfect uh, by any stretch. Uh, they knew <clears throat> it had uh, imperfections. For starters, the original Constitution did not have the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. So there was a lot of discussion at the ratifying conventions about having a Bill of Rights. And that was quickly done in the first Congress in New York in 1789, of course, uh, by with James Madison taking, taking the lead on, on that. But so, too, they did not think it was perfect uh, 
They have an amendment process that's specified in Article 5 of the Constitution, and that amendment process was uh, intended to be used, and we've seen it used to correct uh, structural issues, the 12th Amendment on presidential elections, the 17th Amendment, of course, as you all know well, on Senate elections, the 22nd Amendment, which uh, limited presidents to only two terms, uh, the 25th Fifth Amendment, which corrected some issues with respect to vice presidency, uh, and so too, of course, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the most important amendments in, in uh, the Constitution in many respects because it brought the promise of racial equality uh, that had been denied at the time of the original Constitution into the text of the Constitution. So the, the, the job of the people, is, which is the Congress and the state legislatures, is to amend the Constitution. It's not the job of judges to uh, do that on our own. And obviously that, that's a basic divide of constitutional responsibility that is set forth right in the text of Article 5 of the Constitution. I can't remember who said it. I think Justice Jackson, perhaps, who said the Supreme Court is always right, is not final because it's always right. It's right because it's final or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. But I always thought the more I got into that, the more I disagreed with that because it is a conversation between the branches. And if the American people believe that as a constitutional matter, the way the Constitution is being interpreted, it's within our power as the American people to change our own Constitution by amendment. There's provisions in the Constitution itself to do that. It's hard and it should be hard, uh, but ultimately the authority that we delegate to the government finds its origin in the consent of the governed. It's not something dictated to us from down on high from the Marble Palace or somewhere like that in here in Washington. Well, it I is ultimately our government, our responsibility, our authority that provides legitimacy to the government itself. Do you agree with that? I agree, uh, of course, with that, uh, Senator. The people, we the people, form the Constitution of the United States and the sovereignty, uh, the, the people are the ultimate authority. And you're right about Justice Jackson's line. I think it is a clever line, uh, but ultimately I agree with you. I had, I've always had a little bit of a problem with that line because we're infallible because we're final. No, the, both parts of that are, are, are wrong in some sense because I never want to think of the court as infallible. And I also never want to think of it necessarily, you know, in that in the way you're describing either, because there is the the people always have an ability to correct through the amendment process. Now the amendment process is hard and hasn't been used as much in recent decades, but of course at the beginning of the country the amendments were critical. And Dred Scott, of course, the awful example of just a horrific Supreme Court decision that is then corrected in part, at least on paper. Uh, in the um, 14th Amendment, 13th, 14th Amendments. And uh, that's an important example, I think, of your, probably the best example, frankly, of the point you're making about the people being able to respond uh, to a horrific uh, decision of the, of the Supreme Court. Well, in fairness to Justice Jackson, yes. maybe he was thinking, as I originally thought, about the, the expression as being binding on lower court judges trial yes. judges, appellate court judges, and the Supreme Court does have the final word in that food chain uh, of the judiciary, but not in terms of the fundamental authority of the American people I to decide what laws should govern them. I think that's probably right, Senator. I don't want to be Justice Jackson's one of our greatest justices. To, to question anything no is, is uh, you know, whether it's Korematsu dissent or Barnett or Youngstown or Morissette on mens rea, Justice Jackson wrote some of the greatest opinions and the example of judicial independence as well. So, uh, but on that one line, uh, I, I take your point. Let me just ask you one last question. We've talked a lot about the role of precedent and Senator Feinstein um, talked about stare decisis and um, basically cases that have been decided provide the precedent for future cases. But in the, on occasion, the Supreme Court has decided that its decisions were just wrong and chosen to overrule those previous decisions. 
I'm thinking of Plessy versus Ferguson, for example, which was a scar on our body politic that said that uh, separate but equal educational facilities met the constitutional requirement of, of, of the 14th Amendment. But can you talk about the extraordinary circumstances under which the Supreme Court would revisit a uh, precedent? Well, Brown versus Board of Education, of course, uh, overturned Plessy, and uh, Plessy was wrong the day it was decided. It was inconsistent with the uh, text and meaning of the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed equal protection. And the Supreme Court in, in the Strouder versus West Virginia case in 1880, jury selection case, had said, what is this amendment but that the law shall be the same for the black and the white? And the Supreme Court, uh, unfortunately, uh, backtracked from that clear principle in the Plessy decision. Uh, and a horrific decision which allowed separate but equal and then Brown versus Board uh, corrected that in 1954 of course corrected it on paper it's still decades and we're still uh, seeking to achieve racial equality the long march for racial equality is not over but Brown versus Board as I've said publicly many times before the single greatest moment in Supreme Court history by, uh, in so many ways, the unanimity that Chief Justice Warren achieved, which is a, uh, just a great moment, the fact that it lived up to the text of the Equal Protection Clause, the, the fact that it understood the real world consequences of the segregation on the African American uh, students who were segregated into other schools and stamped with a badge of inferiority. Um, that moment in Brown versus Board of Education uh, is so critical to remember and the opinion is so inspirational. I encourage everyone to, it's a, it's a relatively short opinion, but it's very powerful. It's very focused on the text of the Equal Protection Clause and correcting that uh, awful precedent of, of Plessy versus Ferguson, a great example of leadership. And, and just the last point I'll mention on process, they, they, were, it was, they knew they were gonna face popular backlash they knew they were what, but they still did it. So that shows independence and fortitude. But they also had re-argument, which I think is a good, they had argument originally and then decided there's a lot going on and maybe not everyone's seen it the same way, the justices, and they had a re-argument, which I think is a good lesson on process protecting okay. us and keep working at it and keep working at it and see you know, the team of nine that I mentioned yesterday and I mentioned today. Keep working at it as a team of nine and and they came out unanimous. Chief Justice Warren thankfully led the court in that decision. That was, that was a great moment, the greatest moment in Supreme Court history. Thank you, Judge. Thank you.